This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast, and we are sticking with our theme of money and banking, the Fed, that we've been talking about quite a bit lately. We recently had a show with Bob Murphy discussing this sordid phenomenon of uh, negative interest rates. So this week, we're speaking more generally about the Fed itself and about looking at some of the other perspectives, uh, in other words, monetarists, supply siders, Keynesians, et cetera, and how they view the Fed's machinations, how they view its balance sheet, how they view business cycles, and of course, the Austrian response to that. And I thought there was nobody better for that task than our good friend, Dr. Murray Sabrin, who is coming up on the end of a long teaching career at Ramapo College in New Jersey. He actually has a new book out. Uh, which he's just written in the last year or so, called Why the Federal Reserve Sucks. It Causes Inflation, Recessions, Bubbles, and Enriches the 1%. So, Murray, let me start by saying it's a very subtle title of yours. Well, I think in this day and age, uh, Jeff, you know, you have to be edgy. <laughs> and once you get people's attention, then you get into the uh, the uh, details, you get into the uh, the uh, reasoning, you get it behind the logic, the facts of, uh, of the book. And uh, the book was written on sabbatical a couple of years ago, and it would have been published last year. But uh, as you may remember, I ran for the U.S. Senate as Libertarian Party candidate, so we put off the uh, final touches of the book until um, this year, and it came out in July. And I'm hoping that it does what... Um, uh, other great books in the Austrian tradition have done, uh, namely get a wide audience so we can have a real full, honest debate about the nature of the Fed and money and banking and all the things that Austrians have been writing about for the past hundred plus years. What's interesting about the book and others in its genre is that people like yourself are writing, I wouldn't say popular or pop books, but writing books intended for a lay audience about the Fed, about central banking generally. And if we think back Marie, it was not long ago, really, before the before the 08 and 2012 campaigns of Ron Paul, before obviously the crash of 08. You know, nobody talked about the Fed, even amongst economists, even amongst monetary economists. The Fed was this sort of backwater issue. It wasn't very sexy or exciting, and it was considered this wonkish area of econ. And now. Uh, people like you are writing books for just interested lay people, and there, there's plenty of them. Well, the interesting thing is um, the book has been purchased by some of my neighbors, and they uh, sent me some very nice compliments about how the book explains things in um, in, in the way that they can understand it, since they're not uh, students of uh, uh, monetary policy or, or finance. And that's refreshing to know that you've written – a book that is getting people's attention and explains things so that the average person can understand it. So then that's the goal of the book is to uh, reach a wide audience. <clears throat> and in a nation of 300 million plus, if we can get 1% of the people to read it, that's 3 million people, that would be a huge, huge uh, success to start having that conversation nationally about uh, why do we need a Fed in the first place? What's the origin of the Fed? Uh, who benefits from the Fed, how it, uh, how it conducts monetary policy, uh, why we have all these bubbles uh, over the past several decades. And I think that's something that as an as a academic, uh, we, should have, we should have that discussion because uh, I'm not attacking anyone individually. I'm not making any personal attacks. I'm just saying, look at this institution. It's been around for more than 100 years. And look at the economy for the past 100 years. Obviously, the economy has grown by leaps and bounds, not because of the Fed, but I would say in spite of the Fed, because uh, business has just taken the tools at its disposal with the great women and men entrepreneurs and created great businesses that improves our lives. But the Fed has created so much, created so much pain uh, uh, with the inflation and 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 the depressions that we've had, and so uh, and now, of course, everyone knows about the bubbles because uh, we've had so many people live through them in the past twenty some odd years, and it's it's really now up to us, those of us who have been in academia, to write things so the average individual can make sense of what's been going on. <laughs> 
Well, I have to say, as one of those lay readers, I'm starting to spec- suspect that the that professional economists have actually uh, intentionally or not made things more uh, complicated than they really are. And that's what I think is so great about this book. Now, you mentioned there's a lot of history in this book. There's a lot of background. It, that doesn't mean it's, it's lengthy, boring chapters or anything like that. It, it moves at a very brisk pace. I'm reminded a little bit of David Stockman uh, in your punchy style and also in, in, in sort of, you know, that you, you lay – the background for readers. I want to bring up something to start here that's a little more recent. And that is what a lot of our listeners understand is QE, the program by which the Fed uh, purchased assets for banks and gave them bank reserves in in return. And because of QE and other asset purchase programs, the Fed's balance sheet. Now, we call that base money, the monetary base, which consists of bank reserves, and actual currency in circulation. That monetary base was only in the 800 billions uh, at, around the time of the crash in 08. It more than quadrupled to up over $4 trillion at the peak of that asset buying spree. Um, so because bank reserves are not lent, these are simply reserves parked at the Fed that banks use to cover uh, other requirements and to lend to one another. Because they're not lent out, people like Paul Krugman, Murray, tell us, well, it doesn't matter. We, we can. Yeah. It, so what they're saying is effectively, as long as interest rates are low, at least, that we could effectively recapitalize all of our nation's insolvent banks back in a way. And trust me, some of them were insolvent. Think B of A buying Countrywide and all that toxic mortgage debt. Right. That we can just recapitalize the banks, and there's and there's no adverse effect. There's no pain ever comes from this. Well, see, this is where I think the uh, the, the Keynesian uh, Keynesians monetarists and the supply siders, uh, who I point out in the book, really missed what was going on in 2006 and 2007. With very few exceptions, uh, the uh, the non Austrians really missed the boat, and so. The point that Krugman makes uh, is valid to the extent that as long as the banks don't lend out the excess cash that's been created by the Federal Reserve, things can be pretty copacetic. But once the Fed, inc- I'm sorry, the banks increase their lending, that's the transmission mechanism that I learned when I read Rothbard and uh, Hayek and, and Mises and uh, Hazlitt back in the 1970s. Uh, the banks have to lend for the new money that the Fed creates to get into the economy to raise prices. That's what I wrote my dissertation on uh, in, back in the 1970s. And so we see that, that flow of money uh, going into uh, loans, commercial industrial loans, which is one of the key indicators that uh, Rothbard talked about in his writings. And as long as that is not increasing at a rapid rate, then inflation could be uh, held down. But uh, as I point out in the book, one of the reasons inflation has been kept down is that a lot of these dollars that have been created have, have gone overseas. Plus, you've had three phenomena that have really put a damper on price increases, and I call it the uh, um, CWA, China, Walmart, and Amazon. Those three uh, institutions, if you will, China has been selling us uh, low-priced goods, Uh, Walmart has been selling low-priced goods, and Amazon, because of its huge size, has been keeping the competition at bay and keeping prices down. And so that's what I observe as a as a uh, as a student of uh, economics and finance and uh, an observer of the American economy. That, if you recall, back in the 1970s, uh, China was irrelevant, uh, and so were most of the other foreign countries. And all the dollars that the Fed created during the 1970s stayed in America, and we got the, the two bouts of double-digit inflation. So now we have sort of a safety valve for the dollars being created by going overseas. And so what you have is asset bubbles, the dot-com bubble and the housing bubble. And now some people have dubbed the everything bubble, where real estate is incredibly inflated. Stocks are inflated. Bonds are inflated. uh, Artwork is inflated. I mean, everything is inflated except prices uh, like they were back in the 1970s. So the question is, when will prices start to increase? And that's, I think, the $64,000 question that uh, economists and um, others are trying to figure out. Well, thank you, China, Walmart, and Amazon. I mean, but <laughs> well, the, we the should po- all send them a thank you note. You're right. But the point is that central banks exert inflationary pressure on an economy, while the natural uh, progress of a healthy economy with increased productivity exerts deflationary pressures. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I really became an Austrian economist back in the 1950s when I was a youngster, when color TVs first hit the market 
And I said to myself, our family couldn't afford to buy a color TV because they were very expensive back in the mid 1950s. I said, why would anyone buy a brand new product? We would wait till they start mass producing them and prices would come down. And so I already had instinctively the notion that uh, prices will come down as productivity increases. And so that's exactly what's happened with TVs, computers and uh, and other uh, high tech items, because that's the that's the wonders of the free market and free enterprise is that it allows products that were only available to very wealthy people or wealthy people to be available to the masses. We saw this in automobiles. We saw this in uh, air conditioning. We've seen it in so many products in my lifetime that I, again, having the uh, the experience of uh, uh, longevity at this point, I tell students this and they sort of, uh, uh, I think they sort of get the message that Lower prices, deflation, natural deflation is the natural order of things, while inflation and higher prices, which the Fed wants. I mean, this is the mind boggling thing about the Fed. It wants to have a 2% increase in the CPI. Where that is in the literature is beyond me. I, that was never in the literature anywhere until the Fed decided, well, we should have 2% inflation because that's going to grease the, the uh, economy and make uh, uh, economic growth more uh, uh, doable. And this is this is the voodoo economics of the Federal Reserve is they take an idea and they make it into public policy, which has no basis in in theory or experience, because as a consumer, as you as Jeff as a consumer and all the people listening, I don't know anyone who goes into a store and is disappointed that prices are not two percent higher than they were a year ago. I mean, this is how crazy the Fed's policy is of trying to manage the, the money supply uh, and interest rates and to try to give us two percent inflation. And of course, we should note to our listeners that this really is a Fed policy, an express policy of 2% inflation as a target every year. And, and this is something that uh, the Fed ginned up on its own. This, this does not derive from the Federal Reserve Act or a congressional intent back in the 1910s or anywhere else. It's just something they came up with. Well, this is the thing about economists. I think they have too much time on their hands, and they should <laughs> they should be doing something to explain how the economy works to the general public, which, of course, they don't do. They just tell us how wonderful a job they do by manipulating interest rates. And by the way, in the book, I went through the testimony of uh, Bernanke and Greenspan while the dot-com bubble and the housing bubble were underway, and in, in his testimony to the uh, Congress, in his semi-annual testimony, Bernanke says explicitly, we manipulate interest rates. I was floored when I read that because how many, what CEO would be allowed to get away with quote manipulating prices in his uh, company or his industry? And so this is another example how the Fed is uh, basically a law of unto itself in terms of the economy where they manipulate the most important price in the economy. That's the interest rate. But it is interesting that people are waking up to this. In other words, I think most Americans, even today, as we're apparently uh, getting more socialist, most Americans would object if we had some central planning board that sat around in Washington and decided how many Fords were going to be produced next year <laughs> at w and at what price they were going to be sold and where they were going to be distributed and what numbers and how much an auto worker would be paid. Most of us would say, no, 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 the market can do that. But somehow when it comes to money, yeah. If you start saying, well, the Fed represents a gigantic central planning Politburo of sorts, people don't necessarily go along. Well, this is the interesting thing. I was on Joe Piscopo's radio show uh, several weeks ago, and I made this point that this is monetary socialism. And uh, he let out a, a loud scream, and we didn't pursue it because we didn't have that much time. But again, this is something that people don't understand, that the Fed is a centrally central planning institution. And it tries to have good outcomes, low unemployment, low inflation, um, I'm sorry, low unemployment, low inflation, and uh, a robust economy. And it can achieve that on a sustainable basis because they, they don't have enough knowledge. This is what uh, Hayek called the fatal conceit. They don't have the knowledge to do that because uh, that's not the way the world works. And in my book, I, I take Murray Rothbard's uh, little um, uh, flow chart that he had in the case for 100% gold dollar. And I put it on a page that describes how a free market economy works. And I start all my courses with that to show students, this is how the economy works and this is how finance is related to this and and why we need a good financial system in order for uh, to have smooth operations between production and consumption and labor. And I think students really appreciate it because it, it distills the economy for them in a way that's easy to understand without having to have an econometric model. Well, I want to get back to this 
topic of deflation. I'm paraphrasing Jim Grant, the famous James Grant of Grant's Interstate Observer. And he basically uh, says that deflation represents the process of us getting richer. And mm-hmm. you mentioned your family when you were little, those big, huge wooden TV consoles probably cost $1,000 back in the 50s or something. And, and so this in, deflation is a particular boogeyman of almost all economists and, and all monetary theorists. What, how, why is this? Why do they not understand it? Well, th- I'm glad you brought that up because I think that this is this is the legacy of the Great Depression because during, in the early years of the Great Depression, as you know, the stock market declined 89 percent, unemployment went to 25 percent, and we had price collapses throughout the economy. So economists associate the a Great Depression with deflation or deflation with the Great Depression. So they will do anything to to avoid deflation because they think that is going to bring down the economy. And this is one of the points that we're going to be looking at at a symposium I'm uh, moderating October 17th. And the Mises' own Joe Salerno will be on the panel with a colleague of mine who worked at the Fed for many years. And we'll be discussing about the lessons of the Great Depression and uh, deflation versus uh, uh, the Federal Reserve's attempt to keep propping up prices. So again, the Great Depression to me in reading financial history and monetary history and economic history is one of the most important events of, uh, of, of America that really changed the character of our government, changed the nature of our government, and changed uh, uh, policymakers' view regarding um, uh, how the market should behave without their interference. They think that uh, they're doing God's work, if you will, by uh, manipulating interest rates. And this is why the, the Great Depression is, is something that should be studied in every discipline because it has affected so many uh, areas of our society, uh, whether it's employment, whether it's uh, management, whether it's um, uh, government financing, and so on and so forth. So I think the symposium that we're having October 17th, and um, uh, it'll be streamed live, so hopefully everyone around the world will be able to watch it. And it should be a very good, provocative discussion about the, the Great Depression. And Bernanke considered himself a great student of the Great Depression, and he famously said to uh, Milton Friedman, I think on, on his 90th or 95th birthday, that we're never going to allow deflation to happen again. Well, that was the bad deflation, because when you have a deflation like you had from 29 to 32, that can only take place after you had a bubble. And so they didn't understand that it was the bubble that uh, caused the uh, deflation. It wasn't the natural order of the free market. Well, Murray, we will put a link to that event to sign up or to uh, watch it uh, on our site with this podcast. But it's interesting, you talk about the history of the Depression, which is so unknown in this country, even amongst econ PhDs. They go through their PhD programs without learning virtually anything about the history of economics. But the one thing they do know about the Great Depression, these 28-year-old Ivy League economists at the Fed, the one thing they do know is wrong, (laughs) which is that the Fed didn't do enough. Well, this is why Rothbard's America's Great Depression, which I again read early on in the 1970s when I first became introduced to Austrian economics, was such an eye-opener because I was a history major. And one of the things you learn when you study American history is that Hoover was a laissez-faire president. He sat at his hands while the world was crumbling around him. And Rothbard presents the evidence, the historical facts, the historical data to show that Hoover was one of the great interventionists of all time. Great, not in the sense of good, great in the sense of expansive, that he, he, uh, in his 1932 acceptance of the Republican nomination for re-election, he said we could have done nothing, but instead we uh, used the arsenal of the federal government to attack the uh, the economy to make it better. And he was, and he totally failed. He was uh, humiliated in defeat by Roosevelt, who we all know ran on a very fiscal conservative platform of uh, balanced budgets, lower spending, and restoring the gold standard. And of course, he went 180 degrees when he got elected. And so this is why. History, economics, and finance and philosophy, to me, are the most important subjects students can learn. And then they can concentrate in some uh, discipline that will uh, give them a good career track. But as far as a liberal arts background, I think it's history, economics, finance, and philosophy is something that uh, the Mises Institute does extraordinarily well at the Mises University. And uh, if I had to 
do a curriculum for undergraduates across the country. That's what I would suggest that if we really want to have students understand America, the economy, um, ideas that in, that uh, that uh, have impact on the way our economy is structured, our political system, we have to learn this stuff. And uh, that's why I developed the financial history of the United States course, because I incorporate a lot of the Austrian material. And next week, we're going over the Panic of 1819. And guess what the students are going to be reading? Rothbard's The Panic of 1819. Well, I want to talk about economics today. And uh, most of us on the Austrian side of things think that the profession is in thrall to Keynesianism. Now, uh, sometimes Keynesianism and Keynes are two different things. Sometimes his followers support things that perhaps he would not have supported. But give us your take, basically, on this demand side Keynesian mania and how Keynesians view the Fed and bubbles. Yeah, th this is fascinating because, uh, again, in the in the flow chart that Rothbard put together that I uh, reproduced basically in my book, in order for us to be consumers, we first have to be producers. And the Keynesians have it just the opposite. They think cons uh, consumption drives the economy when it's production that drives the economy. As I explained to my students, I can't be a consumer unless I first get a paycheck. And what I produce is, uh, is uh, lectures for... Uh, the Annisfield School of Business at Rampo College in in, uh, in finance and in uh, financial history. And so they have things upside down in terms of how the economy works. And this is what's driven economic policy since World War II with the Full Employment Act of 1946, I think it was, which put the federal government in the driver's seat of trying to make sure we have another, we don't have another Great Depression and we have low unemployment and uh, low inflation and a robust economy. And uh, they have failed miserably because of the demand side management of, of, uh, of uh, the economy, when instead, they don't appreciate free markets and free enterprise. They don't believe the economy can work on its own. In other words, laissez-faire. They really have this uh, mental block that an economy is self-regulating and self-perpetuating. They think that uh, if you don't have the smart people on board, in Washington or in Moscow or in London or Paris, that the economy will fall apart into a depression. And this is, this is one of the things that I, I address in the book, not the, directly, but sort of uh, tangentially by pointing out the Federal Reserve is basically the, uh, the demand side management of the economy, that they're trying to prop up spending by flooding the economy with money, keeping rates down so we buy houses, we buy cars, we go into debt. And of course, the debt is what's uh, what's the uh, 9800 pound gorilla in this U.S. economy. So, how do Keynesians view bubbles and cycles? Well, the interesting thing is what I when I did my research, there were a few Keynesians that uh, said that there was a bubble. Um, Dean Baker, uh, a Keynesian economist, uh, came up with the idea uh, from his analysis that there was a bubble. Krugman didn't think there was a bubble. Bernanke didn't think it, there was a bubble. In fact, most uh, Fed economists didn't think it was a bubble. I, I uh, cite two studies done by uh, Fed economists who said that there was no dot-com bubble and there was no housing bubble. They were spectacularly wrong because they were using econometrics to figure out that housing prices were doing okay, that if there was a, a, a housing bubble, it would, be, it would be localized. Bernanke said that in his testimony, that housing prices rising in a particular region is not a, a, a symptomatic of a syst systemic problem in the U.S. economy. And so the Keynesians, uh, because prices were going up and... Uh, housing uh, demand was going up. They said, this is great because, uh, listen, this is what uh, economic policy does. It makes a, quote, a robust economy when they don't understand or appreciate the, the, the underlying uh, Austrian insights that once you lower interest rates by the Fed or any central monetary authority, you're going to get an unsustainable economy. And that's what the bubbles were that we saw back to back. And now we've seen uh, the third one uh, unfold before our eyes. Well, give us your take on monetarists, Milton Friedman et al., and, and their view of the Fed and bubbles. Well, again, uh, using fr some of Friedman's more popular work, he, he basically wanted to keep prices stable. Now, I was introduced to Friedman when I was a college student, reading his column in Newsweek. And as a college student uh, who wasn't majoring in economics, that sort of made sense to me. Uh, stable prices are better than rising prices. And then uh, I sort of uh, became... Uh, 
involved with the Austrian school, and they were talking about prices slowly falling as productivity increases. And that made a lot more sense to me because that was my initial reaction to prices back in the 1950s when color TV came out. And so the monitor's goal is to just keep pumping money in to keep uh, prices stable. And the monetarists have this strange view that interest rates don't matter, which is a very bizarre view about uh, about capital and money. And uh, I think the monetarists probably have the weakest view of capital that I've seen, that they have no concept of how capital drives the economy. It's all about monetary aggregates and keeping prices stable. So it's a very macro view of the economy. On the other hand, monetarists are good on some of the micro issues like rent control and the draft and things like that. But when it comes to money, I think, was it Friedman? Uh, I think Rothbard basically said, uh, there are some economists that um, concentrate on the areas that they're worst uh, uh, knowledgeable about. And that's a good example of Friedman and money and supply starters as well. I mean, the supply starters were spectacularly wrong in 2006 and 2007 when they said there's no bubble in the economy. Everything is great because the economy is robust. And so again, the monetarists and the uh, supply starters were terribly wrong, while a few Keynesians got it right uh, back in 2005 and 2006. But of course, a lot of people view monetarists and supply siders as "quote unquote" free market schools. Yeah, and so yeah. it's free market with a giant asterisk, except in money. Well, this is the litmus test. I think uh, you hit it right on the head, Jeff. If you believe in free markets, then why isn't money supplied by the free market? In other words, here's a valuable commodity, a valuable asset, just like any other commodity or asset in the economy that should be provided by entrepreneurs. And uh, this is where I think separates the Austrians from the uh, traditional conventional view of the uh, of money is that uh, most economists are uh, monetary socialists. There's no other way to describe it. They believe money should be uh, a responsibility of government. And uh, this is something that we have to battle uh, lock, stock and barrel because uh, they are taking the country down a path that doesn't end very well. And uh, when I started to learn this uh, so many decades ago, and I was writing about this in the late 70s, early 80s, when I was a staff economist for the American Institute for Economic Research in Great Barrington, and we were very close to a total meltdown as the dollar was collapsing in, in world uh, financial markets. I said, what is it going to take for us to really have the big collapse like they had in Germany uh, that we're seeing now in Venezuela, Argentina, and other countries? And the answer that I c came up with that makes sense to me is – as long as the dollar is accepted around the world as the world's reserve currency, I think we can muddle along. The question is, when will the dollar no longer be demanded around the world? That's when I think it's checkmate. So I think the foreign exchange value of the dollar is the key as to whether we have um, a, a total implosion of our financial system that is based upon fiat money. And of course, a lot of that worldwide support for the dollar is imposed, at least implicitly, by force, right? It's not that the rest of the world thinks that w our fiscal house is in order or that our monetary policy is sparkling and stellar. It's that we're the 800-pound gorilla and we have a vast military. So there's, there's sort of an implied threat of force that keeps the dollar as the world's reserve currency. Well, interestingly enough, next week is the 70th anniversary of the communist takeover of China. And uh, one of the books I read when I was doing my dissertation was the history of the Chinese hyperinflation of the late 40s. That's why China went communist, because the peasants were getting wiped out, their savings were getting wiped out by the hyperinflation. And Mao came along saying, we're going to end the hyperinflation so you will have a decent living standard. And he took over China. But it was hyperinflation that led to the communist revolution, as it was the uh, hyperinflation in Germany in the 1920s. 20s that eventually led to Hitler in, uh, in Germany. And of course, you had hyperinflation in, in Russia, which helped get the communists in power in 1917. So we have examples of how monetary destruction leads to horrible uh, political outcomes in, in three major countries around the world, Russia, uh, China, and, and, uh, and Germany. So again, uh, whether we will enter that uh, realm is, uh, is something that, of course, we don't want to see because it would be horrible to have uh, wheelbarrows full of money having to go to the store. But uh, these are the lessons of uh, history that I learned over the past uh, several decades that I've been writing about. And uh, hopefully I'll continue to write about it as, um, as my career uh, ends as an academic, a full-time academic, and I'll have more time to write more articles for my blog and, um, and uh, get on the radio and, uh, and express these opinions about why we don't need to have a central authority of manipulating interest rates and money and credit.
But, you know, when I hear you talk about history and hyperinflations and bad political outcomes, it makes me think that history is far more important than economics. Well, this is this is why I attracted me to be a history major. Again, uh, growing up in the 1950s, uh, being a, a son of Holocaust survivors who came to America 70 years ago and when I was an infant and uh and I started reading about Germany and hyperinflation and all the events leading up to Hitler's takeover in 1933. I said, we, if we don't learn history, uh, we, we are really doomed to repeat it, as Santiana said. And so that's why I, I want students to learn history. I mean, it's good to, that they're learning business uh, disciplines and being uh, business students, but they really need to know history because that explains a lot to that's what's going on here today. And in fact, at the end of October, I'll be giving the annual Rossidi Memorial Lecture that will incorporate a lot of the things we talked about today and my uh, prognostications for the next 70 years. Since it's 70 years since we, I came to America with my older brother and parents, I want to talk about what America gonna, could look like over the next 70 years if we don't get our house in order right now. But Murray, you were born in the U.S. or no? No, I was born in West Germany right after World War II. My parents uh, were in Poland. They're the only ones in their families to survive the Holocaust. Uh, they decided to uh, leave Poland in 1946, and my mother was pregnant with me, and I was born in December of 1946. And then they decided to come to America because my father's first cousin came to America er earlier who also obviously survived the Holocaust. And my father had a great aunt who raised his mother in America. And then she went back to Poland um, uh, after the uh, turn of the century, got married there and never came back to America and perished uh, during the uh, war. So uh, I was born in West Germany. I don't remember it. I was two years old, two and a half years old when we came to America. But again, growing up without uh, uh, grandparents, uh, aunts or uncles or cousins, it gives me a deep appreciation of, uh, of peace. Let's put it that way. And uh, that's why uh, I, I became a hardcore libertarian in the early 70s when I started reading Rothbard and the other libertarians about the importance of peace and, um, and sound money and uh, individual liberty and uh, all the things that make uh, life uh, worth living of having uh, 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 the nest, domestic tranquility and uh, peace and commerce with the rest of the world. So uh, I, I try to incorporate that in my uh, previous political campaigns uh, in New Jersey, but uh, the, the people here in New Jersey are so enamored with the Republicans and Democrats, or at least the Republicans that are sort of very establishment types, they don't want to hear, they, did, they, they rejected the message of liberty. And so uh, I figured the best route for me to, uh, to make the uh, ideas more um, uh, uh, valuable, if you will, or more um, uh, atten attainable to people is to write essays, which uh, the local paper has been publishing my letters to the editor and op-eds. And, uh, and the editor really likes what I have to say. He paid me, I think, s sort of a compliment. He says, for an academic, you really write well. So, <laughs> uh, so that was refreshing when you get a professional editor to uh, – to give you that sort of kudos. He, he doesn't edit any of my work. I, the, what I send in, he publishes. Well, I didn't know all of that backstory, by the way, but I got to say, in person, you come across like a 45-year-old guy. I mean, you're wiry. <laughs> you're, I, I mean, you just come across like a very yo young guy. So take that for what it's worth. Well, the thing is, um, uh, my father taught me a very important thing study and, and, and work at something that you love to do and be a professional because he worked as a uh, in, a, in a sheet metal shop, he helped build Kennedy Airport before it was called Kennedy Airport, Idlewild Airport. And then he uh, uh, bought his own cab and was a cab driver for two decades. So he saw a lot as a cab driver in New York City. And he wanted his sons to become professionals. Uh, that's what I think the dream of every immigrant after World War II is to have their children become professionals and uh, live the American dream. Well, speaking of professionals, you know, there's an interesting point that you make in your book that we talk about a lot here at the Mises Institute that I'd like you to elaborate on, which is how the Fed drives inequality, how yeah. the Fed helps the rich get richer. So give us your explanation of this phenomenon. Well, it, it, it's very simple. In fact, I quote um, Stanley Druckenmiller, a multi-billionaire hedge fund manager who has a fantastic track record. And he was quoted on CNBC saying, we, the one percenters, love the Fed because it drives up asset prices, uh, stocks, bonds, artwork, real estate. And so they understand it. Buffett understands it, whose father, ironically, was a great supporter of the gold standard, Congressman Howard Buffett. 
and Buffett turned to the to the dark side, becoming a full fledged Keynesian and supporter of the Fed, which of course has made it possible for him to become a multi 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 billionaire. So again, if if the people on the left are concerned about inequality, they would be talking about the Fed like Austrians have been talking about the Fed for so many decades. But for some reason, they have a blind spot also toward the Fed. I don't know if it's just um, uh, uh, ignorance or they're just intimidated by criticizing an institution that is uh, considered necessary uh, for the U.S. economy. But uh, all the hedge fund managers who are super wealthy understand that the Fed drives drives asset prices. And that's not too hard to understand because as uh, more money is created, uh, People have the resources to bid up the prices of various assets. So this is this is economics 101 or just common sense that if you have an institution where uh, wealthy people are first in line to get the money like they are in, on Wall Street, because uh, the banks have the, the excess cash so they can make loans to Wall Street and then uh, people can buy in margin and uh, driving down interest rates with interest reaches asset values. So the, the insiders, the financial insiders, the really smart financial people know that the Fed is indispensable for them to become billionaires and multi-billionaires. I mean, and if we had a free market economy, you wouldn't have uh, the disparity of wealth. That's my take on, on reading economics and finance, that uh, uh, asset prices going through the roof are the result of Fed, uh, Fed uh, creation of money. So what do you think of some of these proposals around the Fed? There are people out there who maybe agree with us more or less. They think the Fed is largely malign and not benign, but they also think that politically or uh, you know, just uh, pragmatically getting rid of the Fed is a non-starter, having pure market money or competition in money is a non-starter. So they trot out some of these ideas uh, surrounding a rules-based Fed, that if we can just tinker with things, uh, yeah. there's the Taylor rule named after John Taylor out at Stanford. There's NGDP targeting, which is uh, cheer led by uh, in, in among others, Scott Sumner at George Mason University. Uh, do you have any thoughts or any opinions about some of these uh, Fed rule proposals? Yeah, th this is just another example of how they think they are smarter than the market regarding interest rates. And uh, again, uh, uh, Hayek really nailed it. With this. this is the fatal conceit of allowing instead of allowing markets to determine prices, which is interesting. All these people who consider themselves free market economists, they don't want a free market in interest rates which I think is really a, 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 terrific, a tremendous blind spot by people who, who, who tout themselves as great defenders of free enterprise and free markets, but the most important price in the economy, they're willing to hand over to a central authority to manipulate. And so again, when I read all these proposals, I'm scratching my head and I'm saying, wh why is there such a disconnect between their, their support for the free enterprise system of, of, of fluctuating prices for goods and services when it comes to interest rates? They think there has to be some special rule that the Fed can uh, utilize to, uh, to, to give us good outcomes. And it's, it's, it's been a total failure. And uh, having been a Fed watcher now for, what, uh, five decades, uh, it's getting worse and worse and worse because uh, they, they, the volatility in the financial markets are, is really stunning. If you look at the ups and downs in the, in the stock market, in the bond market, in the currency markets, uh, you never had this uh, pr uh, 60 years ago. Prices were pretty, uh, were pretty stable. They weren't as volatile as they are today. I mean, for prices to go up. One to two percent on a daily basis in in the financial markets is is just an example of of the failure of the of the Fed to give us um, a framework in which people can plan uh, without having to worry about what interest rates are going to be over the next five ten years because no, who knows what interest rates are going to be over the five ten years they could be permanently low which would be uh, an incredible achievement but they could be spiking like they did in the 1970s so again. Uh, how do you plan uh, for the future if you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to figure out what the, your cost of capital will be? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to recommend to you again why the Federal Reserve sucks. It causes inflation, recessions, bubbles, and enriches the 1%. This is the new book from our guest, Murray Sabrin. It's available uh, at our website, Mises.org, and our bookstore. It's also available via Amazon. Uh, Murray, I got to thank you. You know, you're coming up on the end of a 35-year career at Ramapo College. I think even more importantly, more impressively, you have married to your wife, Florence, for 50 years, which is really something that uh, should warm all of our hearts. I, I'll, I'll be seeing you this weekend in New York at an event, and I want to thank you for your time today. Well, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. And uh, 
all the great work that you do, I think without the Mises Institute, we would be really in deep trouble. Now you're reaching hundreds of thousands and millions of people in the United States and around the world. And that's why I've been a supporter of the Institute since it was first created by uh, Lou Rockwell. Well, thanks so much, Murray. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.